Ashley and I had the privilege of being able to go to a pastor and wife uh, conference uh, last week, and so thank you for that. We were able to go, and, and Ryan um, preached last week, did a terrific job, and uh, we were able to enjoy the company of uh, other uh, pastors and, and their wives, and uh, what, what a great time that was. Although there was one night session um, where uh, there, there was one session where the the the, the couple were, were were telling us, and the, the seasoned ministry couple, and they're telling us, "Here's some things that we do for our marriage. Uh, here's our, our different things." And I just remember listening to this, and I'm thinking, "Oh wow." This is, this is high standard. Um, this, is, this is really challenging. And so then we had some discussions, some breakout groups, and we were with some other younger uh, pastors and, and their wives. And the, the first one kind of opens up and says, wow, that was really convicting. He said, I'm just lucky that one of my kids doesn't kill the other one. I just spend time discovering, like, is that really water on the floor, uh, or is that something else? Does that deserve the sniff test? Um, things are just complete chaos at home, and that's really, like, I'm just trying to hold myself together and hold everything. Like, that's hard. I'm like, oh, thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> well, we're not alone in this. Others experience chaos as well. And so even as we ask this seasoned couple, like, is it different in different stages? And they said, for sure. You know, we be gracious with yourself and understand there's different seasons. There's often seasons of chaos. In, in Esther chapter, chapter three, 3, we have a season, a time of chaos. But it's not a chaos because of limitations. It's not a chaos because of difficulty of raising a young family. It's difficulty because of the sin and evil in this world. It's God's people experiencing and suffering under unjust rulers. And as we read this, as we see this chaos on display, I think there's going to be a lot for us to lean in, to pay attention, and to learn from. So if you have your Bibles, Esther chapter 3, verse 1, we'll read the entire chapter and then unpack it together. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadetha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. But the king had com- so commanded concerning him, but Haman, or but Mordecai, did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he told them he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is lots, before Haman day after day. And they cast it month after month until the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from every other people. And they do not keep the king's laws. So it is not the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those in charge of the king's business. Then they may put it into the king's treasuries. 
So the king took the signet ring from his hand, and he gave it to Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you. The people also do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict, according to all of Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and, and to the governors of over all the provinces and the officials, the people, to every province in his own script and every people in its own language, is written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly from the order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Wow. A lot there. We see this promotion of Haman, and then we quickly see the character of Haman, whose pride is wounded and therefore desires to attack not only Mordecai, but the people of Mordecai to clear them out completely. And they determine the date, and now the entire city is in chaos. What do we do with this account? One thing we should keep in mind, this reigning theme throughout the entire book of Esther, God is sovereign. God is still sovereign in the midst of this. Though God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, yet his hand and his fingerprints are all over it. And because his name is not mentioned that even more, we should be drawn in. We should notice what, what's working here. Why is he not mentioned? And we see him in the details. You see, this is something that we have to be aware of as we face difficulty in life today, that God is sovereign even when life's unfair. Even when life's unfair. There's an old reply that parents give their kids sometimes, well, 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 life's not fair, right? Sometimes there are kids who complain, well, that, that's not fair. So the quick reply is, well, life's not fair. And it's an oldie but a goodie. Right? That life isn't fair. Things don't always go as they should. We have the book of Proverbs that might seem to think that way, but then we look at the book of Job. For Job, things didn't go right precisely because he did things right. Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him. The difficulty in this life is always because of sin in this world, but every difficulty we face is not a direct result of our sin. Sometimes we're caught up in the chaos of living in a sinful world. Sometimes it's a direct result of another sin. Sometimes it might not be due to sin, but simply to the limited nature of ourselves or to others. We don't have all the answers. Others don't see everything that's happening. We don't have perfect memories. And so difficulty can ensue. And we see this even at the very beginning. This idea of when when you're overlooked and, and the prideful prosper. Remember, uh, the very last account, we see Mordecai discovering this plot to kill the king. So Mordecai risks quite a bit to make sure that the king is aware of this plot. And typically, this is associated with a reward. But we don't have evidence of a reward here. Instead, the very next account, chapter 3, verse 1, after these things, 
We might expect a reward. We might expect more story about Mordecai. But immediately after these kings, Haman is promoted. Now, after these things, it's simply a uh, narrator's choice to continue the story. This could be, and likely is, years afterwards. So why put it right next to that other account? It's meant to draw us in. It's meant to say, wait, how come this enemy, how come this one that's going to do this, how come he was promoted? Well, what happened to Mordecai? He's over here. And this is not a very great guy to promote. Quickly, his character is revealed. But isn't this true in life? Often the loyal, those who are simply putting their head down, doing the work, are overlooked. While the prideful, those who by no means will let their good deeds go unnoticed, get promoted, they advance. It might remind us even of the account of Joseph who's forgotten and left in prison. In Genesis 40. It's when we're zoomed in on these details that we should remember the big picture of the book of Esther. God is at work. Spoiler alert, this ends well. Mordecai is even remembered and rewarded, as we'll see later. But when we're pressed in and overwhelmed by the immediate, it's easy to lose sight on the ultimate. But we can glorify God just as much in difficult circumstances as we can in comfortable circumstances, perhaps more. Remember the story of Job, for example. Maybe he loved God because his life was good, was the accusation. But it's when things got hard that his faith was tested. We don't like to rejoice and celebrate the difficulties in life, but Paul was able to say that he was thankful for them. He understood that this is what produces character. This is what reveals his own weakness so that he can rely on the strength of God. It's often the difficulty and the unknown and the waiting that God is still at work forging our character shaping us and conforming us. But even in this decision, we once again see that kind of the foolishness, the, the opposition of the true king and this king. The true king loves to exalt the humble, and here we have one who is promoting the prideful. One who is arrogant, one who seems to be out for himself, one who makes poor decisions based on his own pride. See, the unrighteous gaining power and using in unjust ways is a regular theme throughout Scripture. We shouldn't be surprised when we find ourselves in a situation where those who deserve promotion don't receive it, and those who definitely shouldn't gain it and have power over others. We will find ourselves in this situation. The question is, how do we live in the midst of it? Are we letting our circumstances change our understanding of who God is? Or does our understanding of who God is change the way that we view our circumstances? God is sovereign, even when you're overlooked and the prideful prosper. God is sovereign when you're, you face consequences of unjust actions. Not only do we find ourselves in situations of, uh, that are unfair, but Haman was, like Haman promoted and Mordecai forgotten, but we quickly see how this prideful individual will now use his position of influence in an unjust manner. His pride is a common theme throughout this book. In fact, one commentator even says, why do we think that do we notice that it's not Haman himself that notices, it is other people that notice that he's not doing this. He's not paying respect. 
wait a minute, this, this guy who's full of himself, well, how, how didn't he notice this? He's probably too focused, when it comes to, I love this, he's probably too focused on everybody else celebrating him. Like, look at me, everybody's bowing down. Yep, I see you. And check me out. I'm number two. I wish I was number one, but I'm, I'm number two. And you, you all better recognize that. You notice because even it says that the king commanded people to pay respect to him. This is just custom in the society. Why command it? Was it Haman even whispering in the ear of the king at that point? Hey, king, make sure everybody realizes they need to do this. It wouldn't be beyond his character is what is revealed in Scripture. He loves to be loved. But here he, he finds out that somebody is, is not loving him, is not into him. And, and so, so, so what does he do? He has to respond. And he doesn't just have to respond in kind, but he has to respond in a big way. When your ego is that big, it demands a big response. The ego that loves to be scratched can't stand to be spurned. And that's the case here. But a mere bruise of one's pride does not justify what comes next. We might think, well, if it's disrespect, it's owed something, there should be punishment, but that's not the driving force. Mere respect might command something against Mordecai himself, but not against his people. But it even causes other questions. Like, was Mordecai justified to not bow down? We might think of the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. They did not bow down before the statue of the king. They're honored for it. God rescues them. But as Ryan mentioned last week, we have to be careful of an exemplary reading. Unlike the story of Daniel, here's no explicit mention of worship. There's no direct violation of biblical command. In fact, biblical examples of, of we, we, we can see of David bowing before Saul, Joseph's brothers bowing down before him. So is the action itself, is, is that... Idolatrous? Is that wrong? There's even kind of fables made up around this saying that uh, Haman was carrying an idol in his pocket and that's why Mordecai didn't bow down. But there's no biblical evidence for any of this. In fact, the evidence that we have is that maybe it has to do with Haman's heritage, his people. I like this from John Walton. He says, This ancient interpreters universally understood the text to mean that Haman was a member of the race of Agag, or the Malachites. The Malachites were a nomadic people descended from Esau. They typically ranged through Negev and the Sinai Peninsula, where they clashed with Israel during the Exodus. But during the reign of King Saul, they became, their conflict became fateful. God ordered Saul to destroy the Malachites and to leave no, boot, no <clears throat> and to take nothing from them. But Saul saved some of the loot, and took the king, Agag, as a captive. The prophet Samuel killed Agag, but not before informing Saul that his disobedience would cost him his throne. Since Mordecai is associated with the house of Saul, the clash between Mordecai and Haman is set up as a rematch of the Saul-Agag affair. So here we have two descendants of two kind of rivals, and is that part of the equation here is that playing into the action of both men. But again, we're not told directly if this is a virtual refusal or not. But even if it were, it may have been brought about because they're staying in Susa when they should have fled. They should have went back to the land. Perhaps staying there put them in a compromising position to begin with. What is clear in the text is that there is an unjust overreaction to this refusal. And this is something that we can see 
over and over again today as well. When pride or when any other vice is at play, there's often a reaction that does not match the action. And here we see that not only is Mordecai in jeopardy, but his entire people are in jeopardy because of one man's wounded pride. And yet, even in the midst of this, God is sovereign. And God is working all things for his people's good. In fact, we can see that because of when things take place. Uh, Secondly, the past faithfulness of God helps us in our present difficulty. One way that we can see that God is sovereign in this passage is the selection of the date itself. God, as we know, is sovereign over all things, even those that may seem like chance. In this passage, we see this idea of the casting of Pur, and Pur is a, a, a Persian word for lot to determine a date. It's typical in, in Persian culture. They would cast lots to determine the will of the gods for, determining, for deciding any matter of great, great importance. But we see in Proverbs 16.33 that the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. In other words, God is sovereign even over the selection process that you're trying to do. But the date that they picked in order to cast these lots is important as well because it's the day before the slaying of the Passover lamb. This means that those who are closest to the decree and the threat of harm that's about to go out were probably in the midst of this celebration. They're in the midst of remembering God's faithfulness for past deliverance as they hear of another threat from a pagan ruler. It may also have been part of the official documents that are set out. Just imagine something like, this decree was sent on December 24th. What would come to your mind? Christmas? Okay, that's sent out on Christmas Eve. There's a direct association in our mind, even more so for these people when it's the day before Passover. This is the decree that set out. You are going to be destroyed. And perhaps the people, as they're remembering, as they're partaking of this feast, are saying, yeah, uh, our God has delivered us before. You see, God has rescued in the past, and he can rescue again. All throughout Scripture, the people of God are called to remember, to call to their minds what God has done. And here, as they hear the bad news, there are many are aware of the good news of the past. The same God who delivered them before was at work right then behind the scenes, But this is true whether they realized it or not. Remembering was important for the people of God under the Old Covenant, and it's important for us as Christians under the New Covenant. We are called to remember the Lord's death until He comes. That's one of the things we say when we take communion. It's one of the things that the Apostle Paul said, we do this as often as we do it in remembrance of Him. We'll do this until the Lord comes. Remembering the Lord's death until he comes. And here at Blue Course, we, we went to kind of a more frequent communion practice. Now twice a month instead of once a month. Some of that's because it's important for nursery and children's workers to be present with the body of Christ as we partake together. But another reason is that this is the unique reminder that God has given his church. Perhaps this week, this weekend, even this morning, maybe you're struggling to believe that God is good. Struggling to believe that he is faithful. 
Perhaps it's hard to you, for you to see past the pain of your present situation. But at the Lord's table, we remember that it is finished. That God provided the rescue for the worst condition that we could ever find ourselves in. Separation from him for eternity because of our sin. Jesus paid the price for all who repent and believe in him. And they will be forgiven. It's true, we have hope for eternity. And if we have hope for eternity, we can, we can trust him in our present earthly circumstances. It doesn't mean that everything will suddenly change, but it does mean that the one who is sovereign over all is right here with us and is working all things for our ultimate good, according to Romans eight twenty eight. God rescued us, his people from the past, and he can rescue us again. That's why we're called to remember. We should also recognize that we belong to a greater king. This leads to the the insider, the the presumption of the king. He says, the money is yours, and the people also, let's let's start with this this idea of money. The 10,000 talents I'm going to give you, king, if if you do what I want. So here we have, again, an example of an evil king. Is he taking a bribe? 10,000, that's a lot. And that's going to sound good, especially when he just maybe had some things depleted for um, uh, not so good military campaign. And 10,000 talents of silver, likely half to two-thirds of annual kind of tax revenue for the kingdom. You might think, well, that's a lot of money. How, how can Haman come up with this? Well, maybe he just has full pockets. Or maybe he's saying, hey, w- once I plunder their goods, I'll, I'll give you some of their goods. And so maybe he's saying, I'm, I'm going to take this from them. But then we see the, the king say that the money is given to you. So what does that mean? The king's saying, okay, thanks for this bribe, but I don't want it. What is this language? I like what Joyce Baldwin says. She said, The king may appear to be refusing the money, but is more likely he's still expecting Haman to pay pay it to him. So carrying out the plan is, hey, just do what seems good to you. In other words, yeah, you're going to pay me. Almost kind of like it's, it's your money, spend it how you want it. And him being paid would align with Esther's comment in 7.4 that her people had been sold. See, here you have a king who both claims these are his people and then sells them. But is this true? Or is this an arrogant assumption of the king by claiming that they're his people? You see, the people of God do not ultimately belong to a human king, but to their greater heavenly king. This is true for the people of God. Israel, the old covenant, it's true for the church today. We do not belong to a, to a worldly kingdom, ultimately. We belong to a heavenly kingdom. It's why Paul can say that his citizenship is in heaven. It's true that we still have earthly allegiances, but our ultimate allegiance is to the one who calls us his own. No earthly king or ruler can own us, and have a right to sell us because we are bought by the blood of Jesus. Even those who use fear or threats of physical violence, they don't truly have the right to do that. Remember what we see in the Gospel of Matthew. Do not fear those who can take your life can hurt the body. Fear that, the one who has power over your soul. The truth is that for those who belong to God, no one can snatch us out of his hand. We're his and his alone. John 10, 27 to 29 says this, My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life 
and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Or 1 Corinthians six nineteen to 20 in charging God's people to live faithfully with their body, says this, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And isn't that remarkable? Here we have a human king who wants to profit from the people he claims are his. But in this text, in the, in the New Testament text, we, we have evidence of a heavenly king who humbled himself, paid the ultimate price, in his body, and in his death, for his people. A king who gives of himself, a king who is betrayed for money in order to redeem a people for himself. Today there are many who want to have claim on us, whether it's through economic means, political means, or some other avenue. But we ultimately, as Christians, belong to God. This ultimate allegiance should shape how we live, and it frees us from the temporal allegiances of this earth seeking to control. In Christ, we are free, and that freedom has implications here and now. One other thing that we should notice is that God is not flippant with his signet ring. Do you notice what the king does? Haman, Haman says, I'm going to give you this money. He says, okay, here's my ring. And he gives him his ring. And this, in a sense, is this is my seal. Anything you do, you can put my stamp, my official stamp of approval on it. You write whatever you want and go ahead and put that stamp on. Go ahead. Whatever you want. Here's my power. Right? Really, this, this idea of this king, this this. One ring to rule them all, right? This is, this is the ring. This thing it has that kind of power. And what does the king do? He simply gives it to him and then just kind of goes on. He's not really concerned with what's happening with his ring over there, but he simply gives it away. The power that he has been entrusted with as king is now given to somebody and ruled by this individual's pride and arrogance instead of being carefully stewarded. But this is not what we have with God. There is no one who can put a stamp of approval on things that come to pass except God himself who is sovereign over all. It does not simply give power to others and look the other way. He is over all. And yet, even as he is over all, he still gives us temporary uses within our own lives of exercise of power. And while he is over all things, and he can use all things, even our sin, even, even difficult things for his good, yet we are still responsible as stewards of the power that he's given us. How many of us, maybe it's in the workplace, maybe it's at home, maybe it's in different areas that God has given us authority, are quick to say, here's the ring, do whatever you want, just leave me alone. Here's the power. That's easy to do. Maybe we do it with a a, a favorite political pundit that we hear. Say, I'm just going to take whatever you say, this this sounds good, here's, here's, I'm just going to follow you in every single thing you say. It's even as citizen, depending on where we're from, there's a certain, you know, I think about here in the United States in, in election season coming up, there's a certain power we have as citizen. Are we being flippant with our ring? Are we being good stewards of that? Carefully understanding it's important to use these things for God's glory and for the good of others. Again, it's not just in this realm, but there's a lot of different realms that this can take place in. Are we like the king, just handing it over, or are we understanding the power of it 
and reflecting our God who's not flippant with his signet ring. We see this idea that God is sovereign even when life's unfair. That past faithfulness helps us in present difficulty. And finally, death awaits those who reject the king's appointed. You see this? The rejecting Haman has these unjust consequences associated with it. The typical code is eye for an eye, but that's well surpassed here. Again, this would have been simply, simply something happening to Mordecai himself, but we don't see that. This is a, an attack of, of an entire people saying, annihilate all of them, young and old, women and children. Whether he's able to actually fulfill this and carry it out is besides the point. It's his desire to do it. A desire rooted in his pride and un just consequence of a particular action. But this is very different from the situation that we find ourselves in. You see, rejecting King Jesus has just consequences. We might be tempted that this result is only the result of of sinful actions or of others. That anything bad happening to us is because of bad actors, but we need to understand the reality of God's perfect holiness. If we're not careful, we can demand justice and fairness in our lives. But God's justice demands that we pay the price for our sins. Be careful of telling God, I want to be treated fairly. I want justice for myself. Have we not read, for the wages of sin is death? Do you want your paycheck? Do you want what you've earned? It's death. It's separation from God. It reminds me of what one theologian said. He said, why do bad things happen to good people? That only happened once. And he volunteered. The only true good person was Jesus Christ. And he came and paid a punishment he didn't deserve, he didn't earn. In fact, what he earned, what he merited, was life. Because he lived perfectly. And instead, what did he get? Humiliation, death, suffering. Why? Because the justice of God demands a price for sin. Because for God to be both just and justifier, to be both holy and and gracious towards those who are unholy, towards those who have sinned. How could God do that? He did that through sending Jesus, who willingly came to live a life in our place, to die in our place, that all who turn from their sin and trust in Jesus will be clothed in his righteousness. Because he came to do what we couldn't do so that all who place their faith and trust in him will be forgiven. You see, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, it says in John's gospel, because the world was already under condemnation. We already had sinned. We were already going away. We were already destined for hell. But Jesus came so that we might have eternal life. We don't know why Mordecai rejected Haman. And perhaps there's a lot of good reasons for him to do so. Even so, there might be consequences because of different positions. We might sympathize with him. We might say, okay, I I get it. But it does not make sense to reject King Jesus. And when we do we get the consequence that our 
sins justly deserve. Because we can either try to be our own Savior, or we can trust in the one who is the true Savior. We can either be left in our sin, or we can trust in the one who paid for our sin. Where are you this morning? Have you trusted in Jesus? Or have you, are you still rejecting the one, the king of the universe appointed for your salvation? I hope that you have trusted him, and if you have, know even in the difficulty of life, the one who gave, gave his life is with you and for you, even when life's unfair. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the wonderful hope that we have in Jesus. Father, it's because of him and, and what he has done that we have hope for today, we have hope for tomorrow. The one who is faithful in the past is faithful right now and into the future. And we praise you for that. Father, as we reflect through taking the Lord's Supper together, remind us of this truth. Help us never to forget the goodness of who Jesus is. It's in his name we pray. Amen.